Hi everyone, this is David Taylor from the Effective Writing Center, and thank you very much for having me into your art history classroom, along with my colleague Zoe Fisher. You know, your professor has done us a really great favor by providing a model paper of the very assignment that we're going to be working on. So what I'd like to do in this video is first take a look at the assignment directions and then see how those assignment directions got translated into a successful paper. In other words, if your paper sounds like, looks like, reads like, has the same elements as this model paper, chances are you're going to do pretty well on this assignment. So let's begin by taking a look at the assignment instructions. The assignment instructions begin with some general instructions for the two papers to be written in this course. Let's look at them. For each of the two papers, you'll be responsible for watching a film and writing a three to five page essay. And that means the body pages when three to five pages are being counted. In these papers, you will respond to prompts, which will be provided for each paper. In the prompts for paper one, we're going to read you in just a moment. These assignments are reaction papers, not plot summaries or research papers. The key element is that you will be telling the instructor what you have to say about the film, not what others have said. In a 100 level course, you would perhaps be asked to write about what you saw on the screen. In a 200 level course, you would be asked to say what you think about what you saw. In this 300 level course, and here is the key advice, you are expected to explain why you think the way you do about the film and to justify your explanation using references to subjects found in the weekly content in the Leo classroom. So here you're being told that it is necessary for you to refer back to the content in the Leo classroom and to synthesize that content with your observations and analysis presented in the paper. Now let's look at the particular directions for this paper number one. View a feature film made between 1940 and 1970 that you have not seen before, nor will see later in this class, by a quote, great director. If you would like to see an American film, consider seeing something directed by Capra, Cukor, Ford, Stevens, Preston Sturgis, Billy Wilder, or William Wyler. If you'd like to try a foreign film, consider Ingmar Bergman, Louis Brunel, Claude Chabrol, Federico Fellini, Akira Kurosawa, Lena Wertmuller, or the British team known as the Archers, made up of Michael Powell and Emery Pressburger. These are just suggestions. For a much more extensive list, look at www.filmsite.org slash directors. And you're being given a caution here. Many directors were active before and after 1970. So make sure you see one of their pre-1970, post-1940 films. Also, make sure that you're watching a feature film. The instructor points out that Brunel's Ancien Andalou is a short, not a feature film. Okay, here are the directions. The paper has three parts. In part one, you comment on the film you saw. Pay particular attention to such elements as camera work, which is cinematography, editing, montage, sound, which can include music. But there are many other elements, as you know, as a film student, that you can comment on. Scene design, costumes, special effects, and so on. Whenever you're doing this commenting, you must address these four questions. What did you like and what did you dislike? The what question. You must also include the why of those. Why did you like those things and why did you dislike those things? Overall, you also want to answer the question, is the film a good film or not? And please note that's not the same question as whether or not you liked it. It's entirely possible to like films that you are aware are not very good from a technical point of view. Finally, in this section, you are to comment on the film as a representative of its genre and as a film itself. So clearly label your answers to those prompts 
as part one of your paper. Now comes part two of your paper. Now that you've commented on the specific film you viewed, see if you can draw some general conclusions about the work of the director and one of the main actors. For example, let's say you watched the 2012 film Prometheus, and you can ask and answer such questions as, did you like Ridley Scott as a filmmaker? Why or why not? Or you can ask yourself the question, did you like Michael Fassbender in the role of an emotionless android? Why or why not? Also in part two, be sure to comment on the overall impression you had of the film, including how you see it as an example of its genre and its time period, which you established in part one. Remember, this is not a research paper, so no sources. I'm interested in what you have to say, not in what you can learn by reading up on the film or the filmmaker. And then that takes you to three, which you're to put on a separate page and insert the heading, My Criteria for Quality in Film. And then under that heading, you use your comments about this film and its filmmaker that you wrote in parts one and two, to propose five general statements indicative of your personal taste in movies. Now, these statements should be numbered. They should be written as complete sentences or as a short paragraph. And they should be introduced with such language as excellent movies feature dot dot dot. A movie is more likely to be good if dot 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 or characteristic of high-quality cinema is dot dot dot. For example, if you commented in the body of your essay that you liked the acting because it was realistic, and you liked the script because it had a happy ending, you could propose these two statements as criteria for quality. Excellent movies feature realistic acting. A second quality, a movie is more likely to be good if it ends happily. You are cautioned, do not just put something like, good movies feature good acting. The point here is for you to think about and then explain, that requires more than one sentence, what such quality words as good, excellent, and effective actually mean. Okay, now that we've looked at the directions, let's see how this student, David Colton Hammond, applied those directions to produce a quality paper for Art History 334. First, you see that he is using the exact labels that the instructor asked him to use, beginning with Part 1. Now, let's recall what the student is supposed to do in Part 1. In Part 1, you are to select a variety of film elements, tell what you liked or disliked, and then be sure to tell why you liked it or disliked it. Finally, you are to place the film in a particular genre and time period. So here we go, part one. Alfred Hitchcock's 1958 film Vertigo is very much concerned with physical appearances, so it is no surprise that its opening shot is an extreme close-up of a woman's face. Only the mouth can be seen in the close-up that is framed at an off angle which might be an early clue to the viewer that things will not be so straightforward in the story that follows. The camera then pans up to the woman's eyes, dilated and restless, as if panicked. In these early moments, Hitchcock introduces a sense of unease, mistrust, and a focus on physical appearance that will permeate the remainder of the film. Finally, as the camera maintains its focus on one of the woman's eyes, color is introduced. The color red, suggesting danger or murder, tints the screen, and the title card emerges from the woman's eye. So notice that in part one, the writer is describing what he saw, and describing it in very specific, detailed terms that uses words to kind of repaint for the reader what was on the screen. Continuing with what the viewer saw. The credit sequence itself is reminiscent of Hitchcock's black-and-white film Psycho, where uneasy music plays while lines cut the screen in strange ways. In Vertigo, though, 
see the use of the word though as a contrast indicating we're going from one film cycle to the other vertigo. It's another thing that your professor is looking for, which is solid paragraph construction. And that is certainly being carried out here. In Vertigo, though, the credits in the film make use of color. The neon light green color will make its appearance again much later in the film in a hotel scene. The lines that cut the screen during the credits remind one of fingerprints or often seem to take the shape of an eye, again recalling the themes of identity and appearance. Lastly, as the credits come to an end, the lines that make up the shape of an eye seem to spin until they fade into the image of the woman's eye where the camera was focused when the credits began. Though the audiences at the time wouldn't have thought of Psycho, since Ed Psycho wouldn't be released for several years, audience today who might have discovered Psycho before seeing Vertigo will almost certainly be reminded of the famous scene where the camera pulls back from a close-up of Janet Lee's eyes in a spiral. For many of today's audiences, this moment will likely once again cue the viewer to think of murder. So, so far in part one, the student is constructing solid paragraphs with sentences that flow well to describe what he saw. Now comes the identification of the movie and its genre. Vertigo easily falls into the genres of mystery and romance, but one could make the argument that it also falls into the genre of film noir. So you can expect in this paragraph to see an argument that this movie could be classified as film noir. For example, the movie has a flawed detective at its center who falls in love with and is tricked by the female lead, who is similar in many ways to a femme fatale. Additionally, Vertigo makes use of low-key lighting in many scenes, particularly those where James Stewart's character follows Kim Novak around San Francisco. So now we see a wrap-up that's going to bring the conclusion about this film, that it's part of the film noir genre, into clearer focus. In many of these scenes, the two main characters traverse the urban landscape in shadows, once again recalling the film noir genre. So the student placed the movie in a genre and made a strong and compelling argument and a well-unified paragraph. In framing the film, this is how Hitchcock sets up the shots. Hitchcock shoots James Stewart from a low angle with crosses or churches in the background. This could have been done to foreshadow the moments in the film where Kim Novak falls to her death from the bell tower of a church. However, the religious iconography could also be in reference to the main character's ideology. Without outright saying that he doesn't have faith in God, much is made of James Stewart's belief in the supremacy of physical evidence at the beginning of the film, particularly when Stewart is presented with the case of a woman who may be possessed by the spirit of the past. Stewart's character quickly brushes off the possibility and his female friend asserts that it isn't like him to believe in that sort of thing. In this way, Vertigo is reminiscent of Nicholas Rogue's Don't Look Now, where a husband and a wife lose a child. After seeing a childlike figure, the wife believes the child spirit may be communicating them, while the husband believes there must be a concrete explanation. His devotion to the explainable truth, now here we have the conclusion of the paragraph, his devotion to the explainable truth eventually leads him to his death, while James Stewart's need for concrete truth will cause him to lose the woman he loves twice. Again, a well-unified paragraph that makes a compelling argument about a particular aspect of the film, how it was shot, cinematography. Continuing, there are a surprising number of special effects. Notice how the topic of the paragraph is clearly announced at the beginning of the paragraph. In addition to the colorful, dizzying credit sequence, Hitchcock uses a camera trick that many viewers might remember from Jaws, where the camera seems to be simultaneously zooming in on the object at the center of the screen while zooming out on the surrounding area of the screen. The effect is used to great effect in the film to introduce a sense of vertigo when the main character is introduced to great heights. Moreover, 
A dream sequence later in the film begins with the main character tossing in bed, then the camera changes from being tinted an array of different colors back to natural color numerous times. The dream reflects back to several key moments, flashing striking colors. It includes a close-up of Stuart's frightened face against a backdrop that again mimics the feeling of falling and imbalance. The special effects are reminiscent of some of the surrealism seen in films like The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, where jagged angles cut the screen. So, notice how the unified this paragraph is on one element of the film, special effects. And now we conclude part one with answering the question whether or not this is a good film. Hitchcock's Vertigo is an effective and certainly good film. Though I think it might have been better if Kim Novak's character hadn't revealed her true identity in a voiceover in the second half of the film, the central mystery of the film is engrossing and serves as a catalyst for James Stewart's character to overcome weaknesses. The film maintains a feeling of danger and surrealism throughout that makes the experience enjoyable and memorable. Now that's the end of part one, in which the writer, the student, described what he saw, placed the film in its genre, and at the end made a summation of whether or not he considers it a good film. Now on to part two. Now in part two, you must identify specific things that you liked or disliked and tell why. Here we go. One thing I really enjoyed, so we are clearly identifying a thing that was liked. One thing I really enjoyed about Vertigo is its sense of place. Again, an excellent paragraph topic sentence that serves to organize the rest of the discussion around that one central idea. The city and streets of San Francisco are made integral to the film, with the Golden Gate Bridge, the great sequoia trees, and several other key locations being featured prominently. In this way, I was reminded very much of Paul Thomas Anderson's Inherent Vice and, to a lesser extent, The Room. These movies feel like they could have only taken place at these locations because the city seems to be almost another character in the movie. I would also count Gone Baby Gone and 25th Hour as movies in which cities play a central role. So a clearly organized, well-unified paragraph on the sense of place in the movie and why the writer liked it. The second thing that was liked. I also enjoyed how Hitchcock allowed the themes of the movie to influence the movie's style. Paragraph topic sentence, now the examples or support. For example, the film was preoccupied with appearances, the surreal and fear. These themes, in turn, influenced the creation of the surreal credits, dream sequences, and special effects. We go to another thing the viewer, the student, liked, and why. The idea of revisiting several key locations under different circumstances also worked well. Now come the examples after that paragraph topic sentence. For example, the art gallery, the graveyard, the restaurant, and the bell tower are all recurring locations in the film. Each time these locations were visited, I recall the previous time the characters were at the location, what happened then, how things had changed, and how the next scene might be influenced by what happened the previous time the characters were at the location. So, clearly identified why this was liked, because it engaged the reader in that kind of speculative activity. This revisiting of previous locations reminded me of several classic films like Citizen Kane and The Third Man by Orson Welles. Notice that we go on to another thing the viewer, the student, liked with another paragraph that begins with the topic sentence, including a transition. Another aspect that I think enriched the film was the way in which the main character's shortcomings, such as his fear of heights and his inability to believe in the supernatural coincidences, were integrated into the plot. Hitchcock establishes these ideas early in the film, does not focus on them during the main actions of the plot, then returns to them later in the film. By the time James Stewart is climbing the bell tower and freezes out of fear, an audience might have forgotten about his fear of heights. But Hitchcock uses the same camera trick that was used earlier to effectively remind the audiences. Another example. Furthermore, in movies such as this where a detective is trying to solve a mystery, I find it much more rewarding if the beliefs and psyche of the detective are challenged by mysteries on the screen. In this way, I was reminded of other movies 
where the detective's worldview is challenged by the central mystery, such as Seven and The Long Goodbye. So again, another well-unified paragraph that focuses on a single aspect. Now the student writer is going to comment more upon the film as a part of a particular time period. I was a little surprised that a film of this time period would show a married woman kissing another man, as well as being alone in his apartment with him. This may have been easier to accomplish, since the woman would later be revealed as not being married at all. I also thought the movie was very much of its time period in the way the female characters catered to the male character. James Stewart's female friend makes him drinks, while the main female character changes her clothes and her hair any way he tells her to. Though these actions are motivated by plot points, they certainly might feel sexist to today's viewers. So that was kind of in between something he liked and disliked, but it was a relevant, perceptive comment. Now he's going to comment on the acting. James Stewart and Kim Novak were certainly effective in their roles. Notice how that is clearly a paragraph topic sentence that sets up the paragraph. I think James Stewart's masculinity was put to good use as an able-bodied yet flawed detective. Kim Novak essentially played two different characters, so I think her performance is even more impressive and challenging. So he is noting different aspects of the actor and how those aspects of the actor were employed. The acting in several places was melodramatic and probably wouldn't be found in today's films, but it worked well for a movie of this time period and maybe even makes it more endearing as it lends a classical feel to the film. So that was a good solid paragraph on the acting. Now comes part three, and as you remember from the directions, part three is to be a list, and that list is to have a name, and that name is My Criteria for Quality in Film. Number one, remember these should be numbered. Good movies are often a pleasure to look at. And now we give the justification for that statement. The cinematography in Vertigo was beautiful and effective, particularly the scenes that take place near water and in the forest. If you aren't interested in what's going on on screen, there are at least beautiful images to capture your interest. Now, number two. A great movie will transcend the time in which it was made. Now we must justify that criterion. Though Vertigo was made almost 60 years ago, I was interested in the ideas behind the movie and their execution. Though a movie's ability to be engrossing to future audiences is a difficult metric, especially for recently made movies, the best movies are executed in a way as to always present a compelling, timeless, intellectual question. So there the criterion is transcending time and the way in which this viewer, student author says it does so is through its intellectual questions. Criterion number three. A film is more likely to be good if, notice that language that was suggested in the assignment directions is always used, if it features recurring images lines of dialogues, or locations, and those are called motifs, which the author points out. These motifs are often indicative that a film's ideas and actions have been carefully thought out and executed, and they assist audiences in drawing conclusions and parallels. So another thing he likes is motifs. Number four, in a good film, its style will usually be influenced by its themes, a clearly stated criterion, now let's see the explanation of it. This is exemplified in Vertigo by the correspondence of the dizzying credit sequence and the surrealism of the dream sequence to the movie's theme of the confusion of appearance and reality. So there we have the theme influencing the style. And the last criterion, a great movie will likely leave questions in the viewer's mind after it is over. Though there is resolution in Vertigo, there are still a few questions left in the viewer's mind. Who did Kim Novak's character think was coming up the stairs that made her jump out of the bell tower? Who did James Stewart see in the window of the hotel earlier in the film, if not Kim Novak? Admittedly, although this movie probably offered more in the way of resolution than I would have preferred, I still very much enjoyed its mysteries. And I'll scroll down so that you see there are no references. That's because no sources are to be used 
Okay, there is your review of the model paper. It is clearly divided into the three parts required by the assignment instruction, and each part carries out precisely what the instructor asked the student to do in the assignment directions. Okay, follow this as a model, and I think you're going to be in great shape. Remember that the professor is looking for your analysis and your ability to back up that analysis with specific examples from the movie together with the content in the Leo classroom.